Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so we can start. Uh, first thing, uh, thanks for somebody who sent a reminder for everybody to register for IOP. So make sure you do that by tomorrow. Uh, I don't think the date might extend one more time. So uh, in case you face any difficulties during registration, please reach out immediately. So we'll try to get it resolved. Uh, in terms of our plan for the next coming week, so uh, actually I will be traveling for the next two weeks. So uh, we will be directly meeting on 9th October now. So for the next two weeks, I will be, uh, anyway, I have planned to give you some practice material uh, before the exam. So we can plan that over the next couple of weeks. So I, I plan to give you at least two practice papers. Uh, and this time we will try to give them uh, as per the IOPM format. Okay, So that will be like fully uh, objective. Uh, paper may not be the full two and a half or three hours paper, maybe a smaller paper of one or one and a half hours, but still it will give you practice of those kind of problems. Uh, so now, now is the time when you have to start focusing more on uh, things such as time management. Uh, how can you efficiently uh, determine which problem you want to solve first and which you want to solve next? Of course, in general, the rule is that the easier problems have to be attempted first before you go for the harder problems. So, so that is still true. But uh, I mean, apart from that, it's also uh, we have to determine from the looking at the problem, like even among the easy problems, it may be that some problem is easier for you to handle than another problem. So uh, you have to get your own judgment of your abilities uh, in over the coming a few weeks. So all of those things are something that you have to practice and improve. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the material I'll be sharing will, of, of course, you are will be available, but you are free to look for other material also elsewhere. So, if you find any practice papers online, uh, you can go through them. So, pre RMO used to be conducted for some states uh, other than Maharashtra, even before IOPM was started. So, uh, you can try to refer to those papers. Uh, so, for our preparation, Today's lecture will be the last theory lecture, so to say. After that, we will be only doing problem solving practice. And in that, we will open up to all topics. So, we will not be restricting ourselves to only number theory now. Uh, your geometry, combinatorics, algebra, all, all topics will be practicing equally. Okay. Uh, so, I'll uh, share the practice paper for it for next Sunday over, uh, over the uh, WhatsApp group. So, you can start look at that. Okay. So in terms of theory, uh, I mean, we have pretty much done most of the important topics. Uh, yes, Raghav, you have a question? Sir, would we be having classes after the exam also? Uh, we generally do continue classes, but uh, typically okay. because we are preparing for the next stage, which is in more after that. So, I mean, whether you want to attend or not is completely up to you. So uh, we might do more advanced topics or harder topics. So uh, I mean, it's, it's open for anybody to attend who is interested to do so. But yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, the focus will completely shift because once you have a, once you clear this stage, it is all subject to papers, right? So writing uh, detailed arguments becomes more important than just, uh, you know, finding the final answer. So there's a completely different gear that you have to get into. Okay. okay, so continuing with the number three topics that I had planned for today. Uh, so basically, uh, it was the most important results that we require are already done. Uh, again, just to recap, uh, what, what I think are the most important things you should keep in mind from problem solving perspective, that these are the things which will 
be most helpful for it to solve problems. So first is the basic properties of immutability. So things such as GCD, LCM, uh, their related properties like uh, Euclid's algorithm uh, and those kind of things. So these are the sort of the bread and butter of the entire number theoretic topic. So GCD, LCM, divisibility, um, these are like basic things. Uh, congruence is uh, in particular one thing which we have not done which I think it's a useful exercise for you to do uh, I mean uh, you may already know this that not all powers uh, take all possible remainders modulo certain devices right for example uh, x, x square can be congruent to 0 or 1 modulo 3 but it cannot be cannot be congruent to 2 mod 3 so like that I'll uh, encourage you to find for the first 10 numbers at least so for the devices d going from 2 to 10, for each case, try to find out what are the possible remainders of squares and cubes. Okay. So, this kind of table should be ready for you that you should be able to quickly re recall this. That uh, if I ask you that what are the possible remainders of x square modulo 7, then that is something you should be re able to quickly figure that out. Okay. This will save a lot of time in many questions. Uh, so, uh, things like this are uh, sort of the uh, a basic thing that you need to know. Uh, other topics which we did uh, more recently were things such as Fermat's theorem, Euler's theorem, and Wilson's theorem. So, so these are more kind of specialized tools. I'll say that only certain circumstances will be required. If you have a very particular congruence which has that kind of power, then you'll require them. But most, uh, I mean, Olympiad kind of problems. At least at the entry level, I will say focus more on the first half of things. So it's more of a combination of these things. Plus, uh, the one thing which I keep hammering every time is estimation, estimation and bound. Okay. So, I mean, we don't think of inequalities as directly tied to number theory, but actually, any kind of bounding or inequality is very helpful in solving problems. Okay. Quickly restricting the uh, number of things to be tried. Uh, so keep that in mind always that see how anyway anytime you get a problem where you have to solve some equation that let's say some find so, some number of uh, integer solutions or some LHS equal to RHS first thing you have to try to do is estimate in your mind what is the uh, what could the graph of LHS and RHS look like so if the LHS is a square kind of function RHS is a cube kind of function obviously very quickly RHS will be much much greater than the LHS so that imposes a natural bound on how many values you have to try. Uh, and so I don't have to look very deep theoretically in some questions like this. Okay, So uh, I mean, this is a pay for special attention to these two things, estimation and bounding. And, and the reason why this is important because as such, if you see, ignoring the estimation and bounding, basic number theory is so simple. I mean, divisibility, congruences, it's like there is not much difficult question you can ask on these topics. So you require some assistance from this kind of estimation and bounding kind of idea. Okay. And uh, I mean, finally, uh, we didn't talk about prime numbers here, but specifically, I mean, uh, pretty much the only property of the primes that you require to use is the fact that if P divides AB, then P divides A or P divides B. So that is pretty much the only thing that we require to use actively. But uh, the other thing is PID validation. So I'll be talking more about that also today. So as I mentioned last time, that I required some preparation to uh, talk about this. So I, I think we can do that today. Okay. Uh, so this is pretty much the sort of, if you ask me one page reference of everything you need to know in number theory to do well in at least the entry level Olympiad problem. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the details are more important that how you apply these things uh, and uh, I mean, how do you see the hidden cases that sometimes uh, the thing is that there is some small trick involved in many questions like there is a adding a zero or multiplying by one uh, with which help to solve the problem so that can be very hard to spot sometimes but with practice uh, you'll be better and better at doing this okay, okay. so then uh, coming to today's topic so uh, last time when we did Euler's theorem we left it at uh, basically we defined phi of n as the number of positive uh, positive integers uh, between uh, 1 to n, which are co prime uh, to n. And we use this phi function to uh, write Euler's theorem. So Euler's theorem was that if uh, you have two integers, you know, GCD is 1. 
then m raised to pi of m is power on to one mod. Right. So this is where you use the pi function, but we did actually find the formula for the pi function. So uh, that is something which I want to do today. But I want to put that in a broader context. So uh, in Burton, you have chapter six, which is number theoretic functions. And then chapter seven is uh, deals with the pi function. But actually, I see a way of unifying all of these things into one topic. And that that we can call, uh, and broadly in literature, you can call this arithmetic functions. So uh, arithmetic functions. Okay. So uh, I want to deal with this topic as such as a whole instead of doing it part by part. So in general, arithmetic functions are all functions uh, whose uh, domain is uh, positive integers and the range can be, in general, it can be even complex number, but for us, let us say we are talking about integers to integers, okay? So, so any function which maps natural numbers to integers is called an arithmetic function. Okay, so I mean, this is a very broad definition and it's, as such, it's very easy to define very crazy functions also, but some particular functions are of use to us. So, I mean, those form a part of this arithmetic function. But in particular, two kinds of arithmetic functions are used. So, uh, one which is called multiplicative functions. So, multiplicative function is a function which, uh, as the name suggests, it has something to do with product. So, the, the way it is defined is that if if for any two integers such that the GCD is one, okay, and if your f the product of the applying the function to each of the integers is the same as uh, applying the product first and then applying the function, then f is called a multiplicative function. Okay. So, uh, this condition about them, the GCD of the two numbers being one is important here. So, only under that condition, you have to check that the product is equal to the function of the product. Uh, but, so there is another concept called completely multiplicative function. Okay. So, in a completely multiplicative function, it is exactly the same thing. But the, this GCD condition is no longer there. So there can be functions where, if I just copy and paste this. If I, if I just delete the GCD condition, then this becomes a completely multiple. Okay. So completely multiplicative function can work for any natural numbers, M and N. But if we just call the multiplicative function, then the num numbers have to be co prime. Okay. So uh, naturally, you can say that every completely multiplicative function is also multiplicative, but every multiplicative function is not necessarily completely multiplicative. And uh, I mean, just to give some concrete examples of both, both kinds of functions. So, uh, so for example, so consider the function. For 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 every n, right? Let's say n can be written as a prime factorization p1 is to k1, p2 is to k2, pr is to kr. Okay. Uh, then let us define some function f of n as simply the sum of the exponents k1 plus k2 plus up to kr. Okay. Uh, I think for one, we cannot define it this way. So maybe for one, we have to define it differently. Let us say for f of one, we define it to be zero. Okay? And for any uh, n which is greater than one, uh, we define we find its prime factorization and we just add up all the exponents. So this is what f of n. So for example, f of one is zero. f of any prime number will be one, obviously. Right? Uh, and so on and so forth. So what can I say about this function? Do you See whether it is multiplicative or completely multiplicative.
Oh, wait, wait. Actually, this is not, not even multiplicative, right? Yeah, I think this is not at all multiplicative. I, I think I made a mistake in choosing the example. I, I think this is a example of a, what can be called a log additive function because you'll see what happens that f of mn is f of m plus f of m. It is not multiplicative at all. I think I made a mistake there. But do you see that it will have this property for all m and n? Because what will happen? The if the first m, let's say m has some prime factorization p1 is to alpha 1, p2 is to alpha 2, pr is to alpha r, and some of these alphas can be zero. And n has the uh, factorization p1 is to beta 1, p2 is to beta 2, pr is to beta r. Right? So then the mn product will have term wise, it will be so in general, pi will have the exponent alpha i plus beta i, right? So when you find f of m, so f of m will have a contribution of alpha i from the prime pi, f of n will have a contribution of beta i, and f of mn will have the term alpha i plus beta i. So when you add f of m plus f of n, you will get f of m, right? So yeah, okay, this is not multiplicative, but then. Do you see how to take this and convert this into a multiplicative function? You can define a new function, uh, define, let's say, g of n, which is 2 raised to f of n. So you see that if f has this property, f of m is f of n plus f of n, then it will imply that g of mn will be g of m into g of n. This is due to the fact that when you multiply uh, indices, the, the, the exponents get added. I mean, basically, that's what we're exploiting. So, so yeah, I mean, I made a mistake initially, but we are able to derive a different function which is multiplicative. And not only that, I think you can say this is completely multiplicative. Okay? So, g is completely. Right? We have to find a way of shortening multiplicative right at every time. But anyway. Okay, so this was an example of a function where uh, it doesn't matter whether the two numbers are co prime or not, you can always multiply them together and get the answer. Okay, but uh, many of the functions we are going to deal with are not completely multiplicative, they are just multiplicative, which means that in general this will not be true. Uh, in general, the product of g of m and g of n will not be equal to g of m n. It will be only true when m and n are co prime. So, um, example of that is, uh, for example, d of n. So, d of n is defined as the number of positive divisors of n. Okay. And similarly, sigma of n, which is the sum of the positive divisors. So d of n and sigma of n are examples of what we find are just multiplicative functions. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course, phi of n is also so this is the number of uh, co-prime numbers in the range one to n. Okay. So all these three functions are multiplicative functions. And uh, now, I, I don't know if you want to prove all of them today, but just as an example, we, we can try to prove, I think the hardest of them is actually phi of n. So to prove that phi of n is multiplicative, I think the other two are relatively simple, I would say. So, so to prove that phi of n is multiplicative. Okay, I'll just write multiplicative. So which means that we have to prove that uh, uh, if if I give a two integers m and n which are co-prime, then uh, phi of m n, uh, phi of m to phi of n into phi of n. Okay. This is what I want to prove.
So does anybody already know how to prove this? Uh, I think actually Burton has a very nice proof which we can try to follow. Uh, there is some alternative approach also which I know, but uh, either way works. First, if you want, we can just check it for a few small numbers that why, how come this is true. To get an intuitive sense of, I mean, why should something like this even be true? For that, it's good to do some small experiments to understand what's happening. So let us take some concrete example. Let's say we take m is equal to 2 into 3, 6, okay? and n is equal to some 5, 5, 5, 5. So the claim is phi of m. So phi of m is the number of terms which are four prime to six. So uh, I mean, right now we don't know the formula of phi of m, or even if you do, do know, you can assume that you don't know and try to compute it directly. Uh, I mean, just count the number of terms. So phi of m will be simply uh, one, one and five, right? So phi of m is simply two because there are only two numbers between one to six which are four prime to six. 1 and 1 and 5 and n is 25 so phi of n so whenever you have prime power it's very easy to figure it out because basically the all the multiples of phi will be excluded and everything else will be taken right so it will be basically 25 minus 5 is equal to 20. so the claim is that the product phi of mn so that which is phi of 1 1 50 should turn out to be 40. Okay. So, uh, if you try to look at all these 150 numbers, so this set of 150 numbers, so we are considering the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 150. Okay. If you look at these numbers modulo m and modulo n, okay. So if I just write the remainders modulo 6, okay? so if I write down below this, only the remainders modulo 6. Okay? So you see it will form a cycle. It will go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0. And instead of 0, let me write 6. I, mean, I know remainders technically has to be between 0 and n minus 1, but uh, we can consider it like a complete set of residues like that. Okay? So you see, this will keep on cycling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to the last term, which will also be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And what about 25 in the same way? 25 also keeps cycling. So it will be the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to 25. Again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to 25, etc. So you see, I mean, if I write, I didn't write it properly, one below the other, but if I do that, so these are the original numbers. Okay. This is the row of remainders modulo 6. It will 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It will end in 5, 6. And this is the remainders modulo 25. So this will be 1, 2, 3, 4. So this will end in 24 and 25. Okay. So if I, if I call this remainder R1 and R2. Okay. So R1 is the remainder modulo 6 and R2 is the remainder modulo 25. So do you see that every, so this is the plane that every R1, R2 pair is distinct. This is the first thing I would like us to observe that the, this R1, R2 pair will never repeat. We, we cannot have two numbers which have the same value of R1 and R2. Okay. Better to say all are not that's it. Suppose you had some two numbers i and j. Okay. And what will happen if they had the same r1, r2, r1, r2? If this happens, what can go wrong? Yes, Prado. 
Sir, we know if R if R one R two pair is uh, same, mm. we know that this will have a solution in six times twenty five, which is one fifty. Yes. And that, but if two R one R two pairs are same, which means that would mean that there are two numbers which leave the same remainder and are smaller than one fifty, which is not possible. Yes. So you can look at it from Chinese remainder theorem because uh, whatever R one and R two values you pick, right? So, uh, so let let R one be any number in the range uh, zero to uh, m minus one. So here m is six and n is twenty five, and let R two be any number in the range zero to n minus one. Okay. So then we are considering the congruence as x is congruent to R one mod m, and x is congruent to R two mod n. So this is a, a system of linear congruences where m and n are co-prime. So from Chinese remainder theorem, what we know is that there exists a unique uh, solution uh, modulo m n. Right. So among all the numbers uh, uh, which are incongruent modulo m n, there can be only one value of x which satisfies this. Which means that and so this solves two things in at once. First that for every such pair R one R two, it will occur somewhere in this series on this table, and it can it cannot occur more than once. So both things are taken care of in a single approach. Right? Another way of looking at this was suppose if possible let this happen. If possible let there exist I and J whose these rows are identical, which means that I is congruent to J and they are both congruent to R one mod the first divisor M, and I and J are also congruent to R two modulo the second divisor. If I just invert this, basically, what this means is that m divides i minus j, and n also divides i minus j, right? And so, and m and n being co-prime, this implies that the product m will also divide i minus j, which is not possible because I mean the this this forces that i has to be equal to j because you cannot have two multiples of m n which are so close to each other because you, you are starting the first number is one and the last number is m n. So your entire range is only of size n, so it cannot have two multiples separated by m. Okay. Okay, but now we have to think about how does this help us to solve our problem? We are interested in counting the co-prime numbers in. So uh, basically, there are three sets we are considering, right? The so let's say the set S one is the numbers one to up to m. Okay, so these are all the numbers from one to m. S two is the set of numbers from one to n, and S three is the numbers one to up to m. Okay, what we saw right now is that there exists a bijection between S three and S one crosses. Okay, so S one cross S two is nothing but the set of all such pairs, right? I comma j. So all I comma j pairs where uh, I comes from the first set, which means that I is in the range one to n. And J is in the range one to n. Okay. So this S one cross S two has m n elements, and we just shown them the one to one correspondence between S one cross S two and S three. Okay. In terms of the modulo m and n. But further, I I would like to make the claim that so uh, this is our claim that if If there is some, let's say D, which belongs to S three, okay. So in other words, D is a number between one and M n, such that D corresponds to the pair R one comma R two. Okay. In other words, what we are saying is that R one is the remainder of D modulo M, and R two is the remainder of D modulo N. So you can write it that way also that D is congruent to R one mod M and is congruent to R two mod M. Then this is the main claim that D can be co-prime to M n if and only if the corresponding remainders are co-prime to uh, M and N. Thank you. 
Okay. So uh, just to understand what what we are claiming here, going back to the example of six and twenty five. Uh, so in the first row, if we just mark all the numbers which are co-prime to six, okay, such as one. So basically, all the occurrences of one and five. Okay. Okay. And the second row, we mark all the occurrences of number which are co-prime to twenty five. So those will be like numbers like one, two, three, four. Excluding all the multiples of five, so our claim is that only if both both these rows are marked. So if this is marked and this is also marked, then the corresponding number at the top will be co-prime to the product M N. That is our basic claim. So uh, I mean, even before we prove the claim, do you see that if this is true, if our claim is true, then this automatically means that five is multiplicative. Because the how many entries in the first row, this sixth row, will be marked red. So every number which is co-prime to six will be marked red, right? So it will be basically uh, pi of pi of six numbers in every range. So one, two, three, four, five, six in every range of one, two, three, four, five, six, exactly one number will be marked red. And in the range of twenty-five numbers, exactly one number will be marked blue. I mean, pi of twenty-five numbers will be marked blue. So, uh, if if you uh, combine both these facts together and you count how many how many pairs R one R two are such that R one is co-prime to six and R two is co-prime to twenty five, then that is simply multiplicative principle. Uh, what we do in combinatorics, right? So basically, uh, counting the number of device co-prime numbers to M N is same as counting the number of R one and R two separately. Yeah, actually, this one fifty number is too big. We cannot illustrate this. And let me think if some smaller number can help us to illustrate. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to take a prime number, but okay, let's just take m is equal to three and m is equal to five. Okay, so then I mean, we can actually write out those entire rows: one, two, three, four, five, seven. So this is our set S one or S three, which is the set of all numbers M N. Okay. Now below this, if I just write the uh, remainders modulo three, and then if I write the remainders modulo five. Okay. So this is modulo three and modulo five, and now if I just mark all the numbers which are co-prime to three. Okay. So if I just mark. And the below row, I mark all the numbers which are co-prime to five. Okay, so now in this, if you just look at all the columns which are both numbers are marked, right? So, for example, this column, this column, you see that those are exactly the numbers which are co-prime to fifteen. So one, two, four, seven, eight, eleven, thirteen, fourteen. These are exactly the numbers which are co-prime to fifteen. So this is our main claim that uh, whatever is the number in the first row, which we are calling D. Okay. So in general, any number in the first row, if we call it D, and it is below it is R one and R two are there, then D is co-prime to M n if and only if R one is co-prime to M n, R two is co-prime. Okay. So uh, can you see how to prove this claim?
So this is a if and only if result, which means that we have to do both parts. So first part, let us say we start with the assumption that the D and M are co prime. Okay. So if we do first part that so let let us this be given to us that let D and M are co prime. Okay. And in addition, you are already know that D is congruent to R1 mod M and D is congruent to R2 mod M. So using these two things, can you find the GCD of R1 and M? So if if the let's say the GCD of R1 and M, if I call it K, what can you say? K divides R1 and K divides M. And if we make use of this first row, where D and R1 are congruent modulo M. See, congruent modulo M means that basically they are kind of equal as far as any remainders with respect to M are concerned, they are equal. Sir, so K would divide D and uh, GCD of D comma MN would be K. Yes, but sir. One, so K is one. Yes, correct. So if you see what this fact means that basically M divides D minus R1. Right? So if I combine this, uh, this and this, K divides M and M divides D minus R1, which means that K divides D minus R1. And if K divides R1 and K divides D minus R1, I can add them and get K divides D. Okay. In other words, K is a common divisor of D and R. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, we have to make use of this fact also, right? That the CD of D and MN is given to be one. So, how do we make use of that? Uh, so K is a common divisor of D and M one, sorry, D and M. So when GCD of D and M is one, you say it also means that GCD of D and M is also going to be equal to one. Uh, taking away the N will not increase the GCD, it can only reduce the GCD, right? So if D and M have a R co-prime and we are saying K is a common divisor of D and M, it implies that K has to be equal to 1, that is forced. K cannot be greater than 1, otherwise that will mean that D and M are not co-prime. Okay, so therefore what this means is that the GCD of R1 and M is forced to be 1. And similarly, I mean the same argument, argument can be repeated for R2 and N. Okay, so similarly. GCD of R2 and N is also equal to 1. Okay, so this proves the first part that if the GCD of D and M is 1, then those individual parts, their, their GCD is also 1. And the reverse will also be true that if the, 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 the part 2 will be that if we are we know that GCD of R, R1 and M is 1 and GCD of R2 and N is 1, then our claim is that GCD of the product MN and D will also be equal to 1. Okay. So this part 2, uh, I think can be proved similarly, but just give a couple of minutes to think about it.
Firstly, also we have to use that uh, D one is congruent to uh, M R mod uh, R one mod M and mm -hmm. D is congruent to N mod uh, R two mod M. Right. Uh, how do we start? Again, let's say if let let the density of D and M N be equal to some k. So we would like to show that k is one. So. And what, what we have to use again, which we know is that these two factors, T congruent to R1 modem, So we can uh, start by saying that R1, uh, the GCD of R1 and MN, is, uh, MN will be one because GCD mm -hmm. of R1, M and R1, N is 1. No. Uh, see, if GCD of R and M is 1, not necessarily GCD of R and M and will be 1. Because what if N, N and R have some common uh, factor, right? No, so, so we also have R1 and N is 1, right? GCD. No, we have R1, M is 1 and R2, N is 1. So the, they are two oh. separate uh, elements, right? So, okay. Let's try it this way. So let the GCD of D and MN be equal to K. So what this means is that K divides D and K divides MN. Uh, uh, from these two things, we can write D is equal to R1 plus some, some quotient times M and it's also equal to R2 plus some other quotient times N. Okay, let's, I think we can try it this way. Uh, and this is a useful technique for other kind of problems also. See, we want to show that D, the CD of D and MN is one, which means that there cannot be any prime number which divides both of them together. So instead of just saying that D, uh, the CD of D and MN is equal to K, this is not a very useful starting point because uh, it doesn't allow us to do more analysis. Why don't we claim this that, let the GCD be greater than one, okay? So there will be exist some prime number P, such that the prime number P divides the GCD of M and N. Okay. In other words, uh, the prime that prime number divides D and P divides M and N. Now what will happen? How can we use the fact that P is a prime number now? So you can say P divides M or P divides M. Yes, correct. So, so P divides M or P divides M. And so what will that lead to? And we want to make use of these two given things that the CD of R1 M and R2 M is equal to 1. So this you have to put that together with these two equations. So without loss of generality, let without loss of generality, let, let's say that P divides M. Then what can be the contradiction we come come up with here? GCD of R1 and M is uh, P. Yeah, correct. So in the first equation, what will happen? See, P divides D. So P divides, uh, P divides this term. And if P divides M, then P also divides this term. So if P divides D and P divides M, then it will be forced to divide R1, right? And that's the contradiction. Because now what will happen is P is a prime factor, which is a common divisor of M and R1 also. So this contradicts the fact, the fact that the GCD of 
M R one and M is going to be one. So in other words, such a prime P cannot exist, and therefore, uh, therefore such a P cannot exist. And so the the GCD of D M M N is one. Okay, I think this could also be done by just assuming that D of M N equal to K. But you see how choosing that number to be prime makes it so convenient to finish the argument because of this particularly this step that we can split P of M N as P divides M or P divides M. that helps us to finish the argument very quickly. Okay, so what you establish here is that there is a bijection between uh, there exists a bijection. Between all numbers d in the range of see what are periodically shown was there just exists a bijection between all the numbers in the first set one to m n and the uh, uh, the pairs r one from r two which r one in the range one to m and r two in the range one to m. So this we had already studied that this bijection exists, but all that says is that number of counts in this set. Uh, is equal to the product of this. So m n is equal to m n to n. That's not very interesting. Now we have gone one year further and said there's a bijection between all the d in the first set such that d is co prime with m n, and the bijection is between this set and the set r one r two, where r one belongs to the first range and r one is co prime to n, and r two belongs to the second range and r two is co prime to n. So now this is a much more useful bijection because now what it can allow us to say is that the number of uh, terms, so phi of m n, which counts the number of such d, will be equal to phi of m into phi of n. Okay. So the number of such d is going to be equal to the number of such r one and the number of number of such r two. Right. This is the multiplicative principle which we use in combinatorics. That the number of ways to construct such an ordered pair R one R two is the number of ways to choose R one and the number of ways to choose R two, so which is phi of m into phi of m. Okay. So basically, we have established that this phi is a multiplicative function. Uh, so this can be used to find the formula for phi of m. So The question is find the formula for phi of m, and there are actually three proofs available for us. Okay, so the first proof is we are going to just use the fact that phi is multiplicative. Difficult to write this one. There is a second proof which uses inclusion exclusion principle. I will not cover the second proof today because I had covered this last year, so it is available on my like YouTube channel. Uh, we have to find the video. Uh, I'll try to find it and post it here. But uh, basically, this goes into the combinatorics area, so I won't do it here. And maybe some of you already know this proof also, so we have to talk about that. And third is a very interesting proof which I don't know if we have time to cover today, but just want to mention this using the Mobius inversion formula. So, uh, in the third proof, uh, if you read chapter six and seven from Burton, you will encounter this Mobius inversion uh, function, the the Mobius function, uh, and that that will help us do the third part. But I am at least for me the priority is not to do that first, uh, in the interest of time and also in the interest of not going to be that useful for Olympiads immediately. But yeah, the first function, the first approach, which is multiplicative function. I mean, this is true for any such multiplicative function. That if you find the value for all powers of primes, then you can just combine the terms together, right, to get the value at any other uh, at any other uh, number. So in other words, if if f is a multiplicative function, then for any natural number n. n greater than one, 
if n is written as a prime factorization n p one is to k one p two is to k two p r is to p r, then the fact that f is multiplicative implies that f of n can be simply decomposed as uh, and the important thing is that this all these p one is to k one p two is to k two they are all co-prime. So therefore, it allows us to split the function as just the product of all these things. So in the same way, the phi of n can be written as phi of p1 raised to k1 into phi of p2 raised to k2 all the way up to phi of p r raised to k r. So now the question is simply, can we find the value of each of these terms on the RHS? Okay. So in general, if n is any prime is given, okay. So if p is a prime, then find phi of p raised to any power. If you find this answer, then we can plug it into this formula and we'll get the formula for phi of n. Yes, Anushka. Uh, yes, it will be um, uh, so when we have p to the power k and ps p, p to the power k a p s prime, then the hmm. only factors will be uh, one p p square so on up till p to the power k. Therefore, yes. the number of uh, divisors will be k. Yeah, and therefore the number of uh, numbers which are co-prime to it will be p to the power k minus k. Yes. So what will be five of p raised to k? P to the power k minus k. Minus k. Uh, can you just think about that? Uh, how many how many numbers will be not co-prime to p raised to k? Yeah, sorry, k plus one because it will be one p p square so one up to p to the power k. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how many numbers are there in that? Is it only one p p square? I mean, only the powers matter. Matter as it. I mean, um, could there be some other terms also which will be not co prime to p raised to k? Is it just so the power? Because power's... p is a prime, because p is a prime, so no other number. Yeah, so p is a prime, that is correct. But so why are we only considering the powers of let p, p square, p cube? Because so no uh, uh, it won't have any other divisors, p, and therefore. No, uh, what I'm saying is, are you, are you missing some numbers? Yes, Raghav. Sir, some added. Yes, yes. So we have to also consider 2p, 3p, and all the multiples of p up till p raised to k. Right, right. Right. Uh, you see the uh, problem, Anushka, that you cannot only consider powers of p, you have to consider multiples of p as well. Okay. I think the, our previous example was deceptive. When we took 25, right? I mean, for 25, the numbers which were uh, not co prime to 25. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So you see, it was not only 5 that we had to eliminate, it was all multiples of 5. So in general, for p raised to k, uh, the numbers which will be not co prime to p raised to k are all the multiples of p, so p, 2p, 3p, etc. Yeah. Okay, so then what will, so how many such terms will we have? And the last term is of course p raised to k in this series. So, p raised to k minus 1. p raised to k minus 1, correct. So, therefore, what will be 5 of p raised to k? p raised to k minus p raised to k minus 1. Okay. Does everybody understand what we did here? That, uh, I mean, the, the last term, this is 1 into p, 2 raised to p, 3 raised to p. The last term is simply p raised to k minus 1 times p. Okay. So, there are p raised to k minus 1 terms in this series. And these are exactly the terms which are not co-prime to p raised to k. So, the number which are co prime is simply the common. And sometimes this can also be written as p raised to k one minus one by p. Okay. So have you if you have found phi of p raised to k and you understand this general strategy which can be used for any multiplicative function that you just multiply the products, uh, individual answer for each 
prime power in the expansion and you will get the answer for the main number so so you can write the formula for phi of n as now it is the product of all such terms so for the first term it will be p1 raised to k1 1 minus 1 by p1 p2 raised to k2 1 minus 1 by p2 Okay, so this is the formula for phi of n, and I mean you can simplify it by uh, just grouping these together. So if you see these terms, this can be all combined into just n. So this is nothing but n times one minus one by p one, one minus one by p two, one minus one by p n. So interesting that. Looks like there are fractions like the denominator is p1, p2, pr. So one may have the question why is this an integer? But of course, this will be an integer because all those denominators will cancel with n, right? These are all the prime numbers which are occurring in the factorization of n. So there will be no problem. Okay, so this is the formula. There are a few properties which you can see. Uh, first thing is, uh, I think phi of n is even, right? Looks like so phi of n is even, except for maybe n is equal to one. So I think for all n greater than one, or uh, less greater than two, maybe. No, not necessarily. I, I think I'm making this claim, but I don't know for sure. For, for all n greater, greater than two, phi n is even. Is that true? Yes, Prabhu. Yes, so now we can like uh, write phi of n mm -hmm. as p to the uh, p to p one to the k one minus one times mm -hmm. p one minus one mm -hmm. times p two to the k two minus one times p two minus one mm -hmm. and dot 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 p r two p r two the k r minus one times p r minus one. Yes, by right. simplifying the original formula. Yes, yes. but. Yeah, so now we know that uh, for for any greater than two, there will be at least one odd prime factor. Or unless uh, n is a power of two, I think that case has to be handled separately, right? Yes. Sir. Yeah, so I think we can make those two cases, but in either case, I think the product will turn out to be even. I think yes, that sir. is how it will work out, right? So, I mean, just to explain what Rago said, uh, let us rewrite, we can write this formula for phi of n in a slightly different way also. See, in the original phi of p raised to k, how we left it, we didn't take the uh, denominator, we just kept it as p raised to k minus p raised to k minus 1. So, we can do the same thing with phi of n, right? So, phi of n can also be written as simply the product of, so, p1 raised to k1, uh, oh, or rather, let me just rewrite this one more time. Uh, this phi of p raised to k, if this is equal to p raised to k minus p raised to k1, taking p raised to k minus 1 common, this is the form that we can write, p raised to k minus 1 times p minus 1. So in, in that form, if we write phi of n as the product of uh, this way, p1 raised to k minus 1, p1 minus 1, p2 raised to k2 minus 1, p2 minus 1, this kind of product. Okay. And just regrouping everything together, so it will p1 raised to k minus 1, P2 is to K2 minus 1, PR is to PR minus 1, times P1 minus 1, P2 minus 1, PR minus 1. Okay, so now uh, there are two possibilities, like right? either case 1, uh, N is a power of 2. In that case, what will happen? That basically N is nothing but 2 raised to K of some number. So in that case, only in this product, only one term is there. And that is why I think n greater than 2 is required. Okay? So if n is greater than 2, what is guaranteed is that uh, 
P1 is equal to 2. So uh, P1 raised to K1 minus 1 will be, uh, will be guaranteed to be equal to or greater than 2 raised to 1. Okay? Which means that 2 divides by a So n is a power of 2 is trivial. And if n is not a power of 2, uh, then uh, what will happen? Then there, there exists some odd prime p which divides n, right? And whatever that odd prime is there, the p minus 1 will occur somewhere in this expansion. So, so p minus 1 will divide pi of n. So again, it implies 2 divides pi of n. So either way, pi of n turns out to be even. Can you see some different way of doing this? This is using the formula and everything. What if, let's say we don't even know the formula for pi of n. We just know the definition of pi of n is the number of co-prime numbers in the range 1 to n. And this goes to the heart of what do you mean by even? How can you explain what is what does it mean to be even to let's say a first standard student or a second standard student who doesn't even know divisibility, but can you explain what is even and odd to them? Sir, can you explain what? See, we want to show that pi of n is even, and I want to use very basic principles. So, what do you mean by a number is even? And without using the term like divisibility, is there some other way of saying that a number is even? Can you again use divisibility like when oh, it is divided by 2 will get a remainder of 0? Yeah, that is, I, I'm saying that is a, like at least you require 4th standard or 5th standard knowledge to say that. But for somebody okay. even basic Definition of even and odd. We can break the number so, into pairs. We can break the number into pairs. That is a thing. We can uh, describe and, the last digit. Yeah, that, that is a divisibility test, right? More than the uh, definition of being an even number. But yeah, what uh, Raghav or somebody else mentioned right now that you can break the number into pairs and there will be nothing left. That That is a, in other words, and what is pi of n? Pi of n is counting the numbers from 1 to n, which are co-prime to n. So, do you see how to connect the dots? Sir, so basically we can say that when uh, one number like is co-prime with n, mm -hmm. uh, n upon that number will also be co-prime co to n. You are very close. If you do n upon that number, you may not end up with an integer also, right? Yeah. But, but not n upon. Yes, Rago. Yes, sir. So, uh, if you if you consider any k which is in phi of n, like in the set of mm -hmm. phi of n, mm -hmm. then n minus k would also be in phi of n. Yes, n minus, not upon. So, I mean, yeah, Anushka is very close to that idea. But yeah, Rago is right. So, what if you consider numbers in pairs, like uh, consider the pair like 1 and n minus 1, 2 and n minus 2, etc. So, all the pairs which add up to n. Okay. So, in general, if you consider the pair of n and k minus 2. Do you see that uh, GCD of k and n is equal to 1 if and only if the GCD of the uh, other number is also 1? Right. The GCD will always occur in pairs. In fact, not only this, the GCD are equal. The GCD of k and n will be equal to the GCD of n minus k comma n. So now only I think we have to consider whether n is odd or even separate, correct? Right? Because I mean this sequence may have a final term or it may, I mean, I think we need to be a bit careful about how to finish the argument, but the, the idea is clear to everybody, I hope. 
Yes. So uh, maybe just for our clarity, let's say if if n is if n is odd, if n is odd, then things will work out very nicely, right? Because then uh, everything will be matched. There will be no leftover. So if n is odd, then there is no problem because uh, you will have exactly five of k such numbers. So if n is odd versus n is even, so we have to consider those two cases separately. Yes, Rago. So if so if n is even, then we'll have an odd number of pairs. But mm -hmm. then the last pair would have the same two numbers, which means that those numbers would be dividing n. So we yeah. never consider yeah, so, those. Yeah, that number anyway will not be programmed to n. So so if if n is even, let's say n is equal to two k. Okay, so then the pairs will go like one comma n minus one or or two k minus one. Two comma two k minus two, etc. Uh, the last pair will be k minus one comma k plus one, and then there will be just a one k left over. Okay, and basically in this entire set of numbers, there are exactly five n numbers which are co-prime to n, and we have said that they are always going to occur in pairs, so that for pi n they will be even. The important thing is that this k cannot be co-prime to n. That is why this works. So uh, the density of k and n is guaranteed to be not one. Therefore, k can be left out of the calculation. Then, among these numbers, we have pairs of prime numbers. So, so there will exist some pairs of prime numbers. So, therefore, it will imply two divided by five. And in the case of if n is odd, then there is no problem at all. If n is odd, let's say n is equal to two k plus one, then the pairs will form very cleanly. There will be no leftover. So again, same thing here that among all of these numbers, there will be pairs of prime numbers so that pi of n is even. But uh, this is a very important problem solving technique. Uh, and in fact, let me there is I remember there is an inmo problem which was based on the same idea. The question was that uh, some the very very big inequality, very big identity. Okay, uh, find uh, let. I am just phrasing the problem roughly. Let S be the number of solutions of some equation, okay, some very, very crazy equation, A square plus B square plus C square plus D square. Some seven or eight variable equation was there. And the question was that let S be the number of solutions. Then prove that S is even. This was the question. And exactly the same idea was there that uh, if, if some A1, B1, C1, if there is some is a solution, then I think it turned out to be that the complement of this, like some 11 minus a1, 11 minus b1, then this is also a solution. So this kind of a bijection was established to prove that s is even. Okay. So a very important technique that if you want to show s is even, you can do something like this. Uh, and you can extend this idea. Suppose you want to show that some number is a multiple of three. What can you do? So it's true that some number is a multiple of three. So now you don't want a bijection, you want a trijection. So that's not a term, but that's what you want. So you have to come up with some three sets, right? The original set in which the n belongs, and kind of its two siblings, some some new set is uh, uh, some two new sets such that for every number there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with all the three sets. Okay? If you can find any two such sets like this, then it will show that n is a multiple of three. And in fact, uh, this should give an idea to kind of design a problem like this. You have, you have to prove that n is a multiple of three using some crazy idea like this. Okay, but anyway, I mean, this was just a diversion. Uh, point is that yeah, phi of n is even, and there are a few other properties of phi of n which are also interesting. Uh, I think uh, I won't go into proving all of them today. Uh, for example, I think one property is that uh, what happens if you add up phi of n? Phi of D. I think this turns out to be n. Okay, so if you take all the divisors of n, 
and you compute the five functions for them and add it up, you get the original number. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't want not to prove this right now, but uh, give it for you as an exercise. And if you get stuck, I'm sure this is covered in button, so you can find it there also. Yeah, it is there in button. So yeah. Okay, so uh, we. Uh, Spoke a lot about the uh, pi of n, but similarly, there are other two functions which we also can consider, which is d and sigma. So, d n is the number of divisors of n. And uh, yeah, sigma of n is the sum of the divisors. So, those also have some similar properties. And in fact, so all of this together comes under the topic of uh, what I called earlier the arithmetic functions. Okay? So, the, the broader topic of arithmetic functions is uh, very interesting and I'll just uh, mention a few names here that if you are interested to read more about this, uh, these ideas are very useful. So uh, there is a concept called a Dirichlet convolution. Which is a way of multiplying two functions uh, to get a third function. So it's a very interesting operation called Dirichlet convolution. Uh, maybe I'll just talk about this very quickly because uh, it's a, it's a really interesting. So if you have, let's say we have two functions. So let f and g be two number theoretic functions. Okay. So in other words, if you give you any integer, any positive integer, f, f of n and g of n are defined. Then we define this Dirichlet convolution as uh, some new function h of n, which is given by So you consider all the divisors of n and for every such divisor, you compute f of d and g of n upon d. And you multiply them together and add them up. That is a, what, how you create a new function called h of n. Then h of n is called a Dirichlet convolution. Of f and g. And sometimes it is denoted by f star g. So uh, we are at a very primitive stage that we don't know what is the meaning of the word convolution. But uh, trust me, you are going to encounter this convolution in a very big way later on when you uh, actually enter any undergraduate engineering course, uh, whether it be in electrical engineering, computer science, or any other field. So convolution on its own has a very important role in all of engineering mathematics. But here, this is like a variety of convolution called Dirichlet convolution, which we are dealing with here. And uh, this is like more useful for us for number theory. Uh, so understand how this operation is constructed, that you consider all the divisors of n. Uh, if you take any concrete example, let's say n is equal to 10. So the divisors of n are 1, 2, 5, 10. And you take their complement. So below 1, you write 10. Below 2, you write 5. So like that, you form the pairs. And for each, each such pair, you apply the function, the first function to the upper term, the second function to the below term, multiply that. And similarly, you apply the first function to all of the first terms and g to the other functions. So you multiply all of these things and then finally add them to get the final answer. So this looks like a very complicated operation and the question would be why would we even care to define this that what would be the use of such a function. So uh, I mean honestly there are a lot of different uses of such a function. Uh, one thing which happens is that the set of all such functions itself can be defined as a ring. So, so the set of all, all such functions right. Forms the ring. So, uh, and what is the ring? If you remember when we started number theory itself, we were talking about what is the ring. Uh, 
uh, it is a set of objects under which you can do addition multiplication things like that so uh, that is what these functions allow us to do uh, in fact let me just open the wikipedia page to show you how interesting this whole field is Yeah, this is the definition which I just showed you right now. So basically, it is a f of a g of b where every product a is equal to n. Uh, and uh, so this star operation, right? You see all the functions that we are talking about. This uh, uh, phi of n, d sigma, and mu is the obvious function which are not introduced. All of them are related to each other through this operation. That you can use if you know any two of them, you can find the third one. That is what it means basically. So. It's a whole entire page is dedicated to this kind of relation. So it's very interesting to know all of this. And actually, I mean, without using the word derivative convolution, all of these, or at least many of these properties are present in Burton's chapter number six. Okay. They don't explicitly call this the convolution function, but they are doing the same operation over and over again. Okay. So uh, you can just go to Burton's chapter six and you'll see this. This form come again and again that some f times something g times n upon something. So this is just a short form to write the same thing. Okay, we're not we're not introducing anything really that complex or new, but uh, just a very convenient notation. Okay. But uh, yeah, I mean it will take a lot of time to cover all of this formally. So I'll leave it for you to think about that. Uh, maybe just one thing I'll point out is that this property, this identity that we wrote here, right? You see how to write this in terms of the Dirichlet convolution. Okay. Because you see, it is of a very similar form. It is you are taking all the divisors of n, and only thing is you are multiplying phi of d over here. So there is some term which is missing over here. And this is what I precisely mean by sometimes you have to do this in all of that. You have to introduce terms which are not present. So why don't I write it in this way? This can be written as sigma. Phi of d times a function which I call e of n upon d. What is this e function? It's just a constant function. Or let me call it c then. So c of n is simply one for all n. Okay, it's a constant function. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very interesting function as such. But if you write it there, you see that now this is looking like a Dirichlet convolution. So this is actually convolution of phi. With this constant function, and its value is equal to n. So uh, a lot of things can be written in terms of this convolution operation. So in fact. Uh, I think I want to tell you why this is called convolution. There is a lot of, as I said, you will encounter convolution later on in actual engineering topics, signal processing, etc. But it's a very interesting field. Uh, anyway, uh, a puzzle is due for a long time. So this is a good time to talk about this. So this is what happens. Uh, let's say you are talking about sending a message from one point to another point. So typically like text, let's say radio waves. Okay. So your the radio transmission tower is let's say you are listening to radio at your home. This is your home radio or TV, whatever you want to say. So the tower is going to send its signal. It will be some, some signal which has all the information about whatever TV channel you are watching and everything. And it, it, it will reach your receiver and your receiver will display that TV or movie or radio whatever it is. But the thing is that doesn't happen so simply because the, there will be so many objects in between. There might be a tree, there might be a building, there might be so many obstacles. So the, the signal will not go directly. It will be bounced over some surface uh, or sometimes bounce multiple times over a surface. So what you send is not what you receive. What you receive is actually sometimes completely different version of what you send. Okay. So for example, uh, the way we denote this is that suppose I send just a simple pulse, okay, what is called an impulse. So 
at at time t equal to zero, I just send the signal of let's say voltage of v equal to one, and nothing before and nothing after. So it's an instantaneous function, kind of. Okay. If I send this and through all these multiple bounces, etc., the receiver might receive something like uh, something like this, for example, just as example. Okay. So when the sender is sending this, the receiver is receiving something like this. Uh, of course, in the reality, the sender never sent just one pulse like this. The sender is going to send the whole sequence of the radio form. But you can imagine that even a simple input generates a complex output. Then the complex input will generate an even more complex output. I can even draw it. And the question for a radio receiver is to figure it out. And this is something that your mobile phone does all the time. This is a practical problem for all telecommunication devices, 3G, 4G, 5G, you name it. That if you receive this, the question is what did the sender send? That is what we want to find out. So as it turns out, this is a this operation that water is the input and water is the output. This can be connected through a convolution operation. That the output. So this water the channel. So what we call the channel in between. So the channel is the one which distorts the input signal. You can write that the output is nothing but the input. Convolution channel. Okay. So if you can figure it out what is this channel, uh, just as in a normal equation, if you know that uh, like y is equal to 5 into x, let's say, for example, and you, you want to find out what is x, if you know y, what you can do is you can divide y by 5 and you will get back x. So in the same way, you can invert convolution. Okay. So, uh, if output is input into channel, then input will be output in convoluted with the channel inverse. Okay. So this is what the calculation which your mobile phone does all the time. That it what the mobile phone has is the output. This is what it receives at its antenna. And it has some way of determining what is the channel doing. So it can multiply out this factor to get back what was the input signal, what the actual tower sent. And unless your mobile phone does it, there is no way to cleanly get a signal. And imagine that if you're talking to somebody, your friend or a relative, and you hear multiple echoes, uh, they say hello, and you hear hello, 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 hello five times. Uh, that is what will happen if you don't do this back conversation. Okay. So this is, all of this is happening in the signal processing space. But what I'm showing is that uh, here we are doing something very similar. This translate convolution is doing the same thing, but with discrete numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 to 10. Uh, your original function is in a, if you put it in this way, the this f and g are like the input or uh, input of your uh, transmission tower and the channel. And the uh, h is the output that you are getting. And so if you know the output and you know the channel, then you can apply the inverse function to get back the input. Okay. And now here the question is, how do you construct this inverse of the channel? And that is what chapter six is all about. Okay. So the Mobius inversion function is exactly this operation. From G, how do you construct the G inverse? That is what the Mobius inversion function does for you. Uh, but uh, I'll leave it for you to read about this theoretically. Okay, I don't want to go into that. But yeah, I mean, so the point is that a lot of things that we do here have deep connections into engineering disciplines of various kinds. Uh, so, I mean, often the question we get asked is why should we study all this mathematics? Uh, the, the reason is that it helps to solve real engineering problems. Okay. But anyway, I want to segue now uh, into a different topic, which is P I D to NUC. So this is pretty much the last topic in theory. And after this, we will be only doing problem solving. So from so next two weeks anyway, I'm not there, but once we are back, we will be doing problem solving. So last time, I think you already defined the PID validation. Uh, and it's also one more number theoretic function, if you think about it. Because what is this function if let P be any prime? Then for all n, we define 
and let's take n greater than this or greater than one. Oh, okay, so n greater than one. Then it's fine. We define v p of n as k if p is to k divides n p k plus one does not divide. Okay, so v p of n is the highest exponent of p, highest power of p, which divides n such that the next power does not divide in. And uh, sometimes in literature, this is also shown in the short form as p raised to k. If you see this kind of notation anywhere, p raised to k double bar n. This is a short form of saying that p raised to k divides n, but the next power of p does not divide in. So, so these two are equivalent notation. Okay, so this is vp of n. Uh, and uh, I think as I mentioned last time, this can be extended to rational numbers also, but we will not look into that right now. Uh, what I am interested to see is some applications of this VP of N, that how it can be used to solve some interesting problem. So, uh, I mean, just to give some examples, like VP of 24, uh, like V2 of 24 is 2, and V3 of 24 is 3, right? Okay, this is because 24 is 2 raised to 3 into 3 raised to 1. And any other uh, prime which doesn't occur in the factorization, the VP will be 0. So, uh, like some basic properties, can you see what will be P for any, any numbers M and N? What will be VP of M, uh, VP of MN rather? Will be VP of M plus VP of M, right? Because water is the highest power of P which occurs in the factorization of M and the factorization of N that will simply get added up when you compute MN. Okay, what about VP of M plus N? What can you say about the VP of the sum? Hmm. So uh, we are not able to always determine VP of M plus N also, but if you wanted to, uh, if you consider, let's say M has some factorization P raised to K times, or let, let me use this notation now from now, this double bar. So let's say that P raised to K completely divides M, which, which also means that P raised to K plus one does not divide M, but I won't write that every time. This notation is supposed to mean that also. And let's say P raised to L complete device N. So what about M plus N? Sir, so, may I say? Yes. So uh, it uh, P raised to uh, the minimum of K and L will divide mm -hmm. it. Yes, correct. Because what will happen? M will be some let's say some quotient q1 times p raised to k and n will be some another quotient q2 times p raised to n. So if I add them, I get m plus n, which is, so here we have to take something common. So for that, we need to know which of k and n is smaller. So let's say without loss of generality, and you have to make two cases here actually. So k and n can be equal also, right? So in fact, there will be, let us make these two cases. So case one, that K and L are not equal. So let's say without loss of generality that K is less than L. Okay. So what will happen in this case, M plus N, which is Q1 P raised to K plus Q2 P raised to L. What can we take common? P to the K. P to the K, right? 
तो पी टू के इन साइड ऑफ क्यू वन प्लस क्यू टू टाइम्स पी एस टू एल माइनस टू नाउ The important thing is that when I wrote m is q one p is to k, and the fact that p is to k is the highest power of m, this implies that p does not divide q one, and p does not divide q two, right? Otherwise, this uh, k and l can be increased even further. So the the VP definition means that the water is the remaining portion is completely devoid of any powers of p. Therefore, what can you say about this term? This m plus one is p is to k times this. Do you see that this term is also p cannot divide this term because p divides this term definitely and p does not divide q one. Therefore, p cannot divide this sum also, right? So, therefore, what will be the VP of m plus n? It will be k. In other words, it is the minimum of k and n. Okay. So, VP of m plus n is minimum of VP of m and VP of n, if the two are not equal, okay. But what will happen if they are equal? Now it's a bit more complicated thing because now m plus n is q one p raised to k plus q two. We can write k in both places. Q one plus q two. See now it is perfectly possible that although p does not divide q one. And p does not divide q two. It could be that p divides the sum. This could happen, or it may not happen. We don't know for sure. So this term, we don't know whether it will be multiple of p or not a multiple of p. But what is guaranteed again is that p is to k definitely divides m plus n. So whatever is the VP of m plus n is at least k. It can be greater also depending on what is the condition of this term, right? But it will be guaranteed to be at least k. Okay, now do you follow this? So this is how the two cases have to be dealt with. That if the m and n have unequal VP, then you can simply say it's the minima. Otherwise, uh, the only thing we can say is that the VP is greater than the whatever is the common VP. So uh, and there is also one more uh, theorem which is called lifting the exponent. And let me just copy this because sometimes I forget the condition. So if P is an odd prime. And uh, a comma b t integers such that okay. So in other words, uh, p is co prime to both a and b. Then uh, and uh, p divides a minus b. So in other words, a and b are congruent modulo p, but they are both co prime to p. So then. is a very very interesting lemma because you see what's happening here on the lhs the n is an exponent a is to n minus b is to n and on the rhs suddenly it has come down as just a normal term which is like almost like a magical transformation that something that is an exponent suddenly becomes a, a normal number 
this is called lifting the exponent lemma or theorem sometimes. Okay, so you see why it is called lifting the exponent because the the n which is there below suddenly gets lifted and becomes the exponent on the LHS. In fact, this property is so interesting. I think that we should just check it with a few small examples to convince ourselves that something like this can even be true. So let's we can take some number. Let's say p equal to three. And so a and b have to be uh, co prime but separated by three. So we can let's say for example a is equal to pi, b is equal to two. And so we can try with different terms. n is equal to one, n is equal to two. So n is equal to one, the LHS will be uh, BP of pi raised to one minus two raised to one. Uh, and BP will be three. Uh, in fact, let's make a table instead of writing this way. Value of n, value of a is to a minus two is to one, value of LHS and value of RHS. Is equal to one, then this is t. So we be the largest exponent we divide is one. And what will the RHS be? So we p of a minus b, we can just pretty compute that is simply one. So R this is one plus V three of one which is zero. So this answer is simply one. Then we go to help compute RHS, we can write V three of any other time. So I take two, then this is pi square minus two square is twenty-five minus four, which is twenty-one. So again, B P of two is zero. So this is two. If n is three, now see what happens. This is pi cube minus two cube. So one can be pi minus three is one and seven. You see, this is. So you see, only for the third term where we are taking pi cube minus two cube, the when B P of n, B P of three is one. That is when the RHS VP increased by one, and at the exactly the same time, this A raised to the minus B raised to n comes. So this pi cube minus two cube is also divisible by not just three but by nine also. So very curious pattern. And again, you'll see for the next term. So I don't keep on writing it, but four and five, you'll see that the VP will because this will be zero, right? So I got four and five, the VP will be zero. For six again, it is one. And then if you continue seven, eight, and for nine, the VP is two over here. So what we are saying is that uh, very very interesting property. So pi raised to nine minus two raised to nine will be divisible by three cube. Uh, so uh, this will be three. So very very curious pattern. Yeah, I suggest you to try a few more examples and just cross check how this is happening. Uh, and this is a very recent result for me. And this could be a very old result, but I never studied this when I was a student. I, I came across this result while training the last four or five years students. So this is like a very new pattern, I'll say, which has come up in Olympiads of using this VP, like periodic valuation in general, and this kind of exponent, lifting the exponent lemma, etc. Um, I also have to take some help here. Okay, what I'll do, I'll just send you the link of a PDF where this is covered very nicely. So instead of me going through it, better that you take the time to read. And there are a lot of Olympiad problems also which are solved using this PID valuation. So uh, that's a better way to do it. Than... Okay. 
Okay, but anyway, I'll send it to you after our uh, meeting is over. So yeah, I mean, this PID evaluation is the last sort of part of the entire problem. So you could cool kit that you need to know. So if I just go back up to the starting point, we are almost towards the end of the lecture. So yeah, so PID evaluation is the new and latest interesting trend that we but yeah, I mean, in, in one page, this is all the things that you need to know really to master problem solving at Olympiad level or at least the elementary level. Uh, so take your time to, uh, uh, whenever you try a new problem, try out every possible tool that have you tried this, have you tried that. Uh, there are only two things which can happen. Either one of the tools which you know will solve the problem. And uh, so then you know that this tool can be used for this kind of problem. Or you might realize that none of the tools which you have can solve the problem. And then you go read the solution and the solution will give you one new tool or one new technique which you add to your toolkit. So in either way, you have to keep improving your toolkit. <coughs> either to use the tools to solve existing problems or to add new tools to your tool. So we have around 15 minutes left. So uh, maybe you can just complete the puzzle which I mentioned last time. Uh, in fact, there are two things which I mentioned last time. Right? One was that piecewise linear function, if you can construct a formula for that. And there was a problem about the polynomial evaluation that Alice and Bob are playing a game. I think those, those are two things which we have to do. Uh, maybe first we can talk about the Alice and Bob problem. Okay, so just to recap what was the problem. Uh, so there is some polynomial which has all non-negative co integer coefficients. These AIs are all literally equal to zero and integers. And Alice can send Bob one rupee and one value of X. And Bob replies with the value of P of X. So how many such questions did Alice have to ask to find out the answer? And the important thing, we don't even know the degree of the polynomial. See, if we knew the degree n, then this is all a standard like Lagrange interpolation kind of problem, right? Which we know how to do. So anybody has any strategy to deal with this? Like if you are Alice, what question will you ask? And how much will it cost you? And at the very least, you might be expecting that as n gets larger and larger, Alice will have to pay more, right, to get that information. If n is a really big number, like 10,000, 10 lakh or something like that, there are so many coefficients to estimate. So Alice will have to ask a lot of questions to get the answers. So, so even before telling you the strategy, let me tell you the answer. Maybe the answer will help you to get a hint. So if Alice has to pay one rupee per question, how many rupees does Alice have to spend? So answer is two rupees. No matter how big N is, Alice only has to spend two rupees. In other words, Alice only has to ask two questions to find out the value of the polynomial. Even if N is 10,000 lakh crore, Two questions are sufficient. How can that be right? So here is the second hint. As it turns out, we are sending each other polynomials all the time, but we just don't know they are polynomials.
by that what i mean is that suppose somebody tells me a number okay? suppose you tell me some very very big number i don't know for what reason maybe this is a mobile number or some for some reason you told me this number 1 1371059 okay you told me this number everybody understands place value what is this number other than the evaluation of a polynomial p of x which is 0123456 x raised to 6 plus 3 x raised to 5 plus 7 x raised to 4 Plus seven x cube plus zero x square plus five x plus nine. This number is nothing but p of ten, right? So when you told me this number, you are actually sending me a polynomial evaluated at ten. And the reason why this system works is because we all know that the digits can only go from zero to nine. Yes, Rahul. So I think I got the solution. Okay, go ahead. So first, Alice would ask Bob, uh, mm -hmm. p of one. Right. The sum of coefficients. So say that would be, um, a a n plus a n minus one plus a two all the way to a two plus a one. So we'll get the sum of coefficients. Yes. And we'll call that sum s suppose. Now since all of these are non-negative integers. Hmm. They have to be smaller than s. Yes, so all here are smaller than s. So I'm so then we will ask. Uh, or they can be equal to s. Right? I mean, for example, it could be that polynomials yes. consist of one number. Yes, sir. Okay. So then Alice could ask Bob the value of a uh, p of s plus one. Yes, correct. And then convert it into base. Yes. Yes. Or uh, base s plus one, right? Sorry, yeah, base s plus one. Yeah, that's it. So, uh, uh, I I don't know if everybody followed the logic behind this solution, but just think about it. That this number, if I consider a sufficiently large base, where all this a n a n minus one a n is, it can be considered digits in that base. Right, then every number can be uniquely represented in that base S representation. So if if I, I if if I call S plus one as T, okay, then your what is the polynomial P of n, which is a n x plus two n plus n minus one x plus two n minus one. Okay, if I find the value of P T, which is a n T t plus two n plus n minus one t plus two n minus one plus What is this value? If I write it in base t, right? The digits will be a n, n minus one, a n minus two, a one, a zero. And the reason why this will work is because each of the coefficients, the digits, so called, all the a are are guaranteed to be less than t in this range zero, a and t. This is why this uh, solution works. So we have not done base representation formally, but uh, I mean intuitively I understand that everybody understand. We all already have done one base which is binary uh, and decimal representation which we all know. But the same can be extended to any base b. Uh, but uh, actually that is one topic which we can cover maybe after the in, in the next month. Okay. But in a way this is like a very soft introduction to the base representation concept. That if you know the base. The largest base which is sufficient to represent all the digits, and you ask the Bob to evaluate the polynomial in that base, you will get the answer that you are asking for. I mean, just to give a concrete example, in case this is not clear that how this technique works, I will take a small example. Let's say the polynomial p of x is x raised to five plus five x plus one. Okay. So when Alice asks, "What is the value of one p of one?" rather, and Bob will reply that p of one is seven. 
okay so now what alice knows is that all the coefficients are less than or equal to 7 so therefore now next alice will ask value of p of 8 so Bob will evaluate p of 8 so p of 8 is what 8 is to 5 So Bob replies with the number 32809. So now what Alice has to do is write 32809 in terms of base 8. So base 8 means each position represents a power of 8. So we have to write this in this place. And I mean, uh, I'm going to detail, but basically you can take the remainder of this modulo eight. Okay? So if you go modulo eight, what is the remainder of this? The remainder is one, right? So that is the last digit. So you subtract one, you get three to eight zero eight and divide by eight. So you get four one zero one. Okay? So you can continue this process. Now, four one zero one again divided by five, or divided by eight, you'll see the remainder is five. So the next digit is five. So then 410 minus 5 will be whatever 4096. Okay. And now 4096, I can quickly just write it is just going to be 82. Okay. So then so I just know what is the polynomial. It is x raised to 5 plus 5 8 plus 1. Okay. So this only works because all the coefficients are going to be non-negative integers. And you can find out this upper bound that which upper bound is sufficient to determine all the digits of your number. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope everybody followed this, but if not, you can just think about base representations a bit more and it will come to you. Okay, this was the first puzzle. What was the second puzzle? The piecewise linear function. Uh, so, does anybody have a formula for that original function? Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sorry to disturb, but I have, I have some other class for which I need to uh, leave. So, so maybe yeah, I okay, no problem. Also, so you were talk, telling something about two weeks, you'll not be there. So, do we have a class for the next two weeks? No, no. So, I will send you a practice paper which you can solve at home. So, 25th and 2nd October, we will not have a class. We will directly meet on 9th October. Okay. But in the meanwhile, I'll give you some practice material. Okay. Yeah. So for the piecewise linear function, let's start with a simple example. Let's not do that very hard problem first. So I'll, I'll draw a graph here and your job is to come up with a formula for that graph. So I'll start very simple, something that you already know the answer to. So what is the formula for this graph? These are both 45 degree lines. Mod X, correct? This is simply mod X. Okay. Then what about this graph? So this is 45 degree, but now it is zero on the RHS. So we will have like two, like we'll have like two intervals kind of. Mm -hmm. For x smaller than zero, y would be mod x, and for yeah. x greater than or equal to zero, y would be zero. Yeah, that is true. Sir, I think it would be mod x minus x. Huh. I mean, I'm looking for a simple formula which works regardless of making this kind of cases. So yeah. 
So what happens for mod x minus x if you consider y is equal to y x? If you look at this function, how it will, you see it will satisfy the RHS properly. I mean, the greater than zero case is satisfied correctly by this function, right? For, for x less than zero, what is the value of this? For x less than zero, mod x will be minus x, so this will be minus 2x. So the slope of the line will not be 45 degrees. Right. So what should we do? Divide by two. Yeah, correct. Right? So the right answer is mod x minus x half of this. Okay. Does everybody follow that this function will have this graph? And see, interesting divide by two doesn't affect the RHS. I mean greater than zero region. This is anyway zero. So dividing by two doesn't make any difference. But here it fixes the slope on the RHS properly, right? Okay, so these are like good beginnings that how you see how you can combine functions to create some new functions. Uh, so now what about this? And this is just a variation of the previous function, nothing really new, but just to get some ideas. Let's say this point is 1, 0. Okay, so this is just a previous function but shifted by uh, 1. So this is simply a shift of origin. You know what that means? That wherever the previous formula part had x, right? Just have to replace that with x minus one. Because any value on this function, if I just reduce the value of x by minus one, it will go back to this formula, right? So this can be simplified as half of x minus one minus x minus one. Does everybody follow this? Okay, then in a similar way, what if the function look like this? Uh, now it is minus one comma zero, and it is looking like this. Again, forty five degree angle. So it is like a mirror image of this function. Instead of plus, it uh, minus it would be plus. Uh, sorry, what is the function? The mod of x plus x by two. No, but uh, it is also at minus one comma zero. Right? It is not centered at the origin. Mod of x oh, plus one plus x plus one by two. Plus one plus x plus one. This is what? Yes. Yes, that is correct. And I mean the way you can obtain it from this function. See, if you do it one step at a time, see from how from this we obtain this by shift of origin. By we replaced x with x minus one uh, because the graph shifted to the right. Here the graph is getting reflected in the y-axis. So what can you do in this function is simply replace x with minus x, right? In this function, if you simply replace x with minus x, I'll get the value minus x minus 1 minus of minus x minus 1. And now this can be simplified. So mod of minus x minus 1 can be considered equivalent to mod of x plus 1. And you can expand it that way. So you'll get this formula. Okay. And since we are almost out of time, the last thing that once you know how to do this, you can know how to do anything. What if we add both of these graphs? I'm not literally add, but 
uh, find the formula for this. This is one comma zero, zero comma one, and minus one minus. So there are two ways to solve this actually. One is about a formula shortcut method because we are going to exploit a lot of symmetry which is there in this problem, but it may not be the case for a different problem. But here, if you observe two things, first is that the graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So for now, let us ignore the left half completely. Okay? Let us only solve this question for x greater than zero because we can just take the mod of x. Okay? So for, for, for x greater than zero, we are interested for the graph to look like this. Okay. And now here, if you notice, what if we consider a line which goes like this? Okay. And at, from this point onwards, I just want it to be reset back to zero. So the equation of this line originally, which uh, doesn't uh, end at the zero, this is simply y is equal to 1 minus x, correct? This is this line. But as I as I want, you see here the, the first problem that we did, this is coming into picture, this problem. I want this to happen, but at x equal to 1. So if I take, so this is the graph of y equal to 1 minus x. This is the graph of y equal to mod of 1 minus x. So if I add these two graphs together, what will I get? Or rather take the average of these two, these two graphs. So what if I consider y is equal to 1 minus 6 plus mod of 1 minus 6. Unfortunately, my 1 and mod are similar. You see that 1 minus 6 plus mod of 1 minus 6, this graph will do precisely how we want. But this is just on the right hand side, which is where x greater than 0. I want the same behavior on the left hand side also. So what I can do is simply take mod of x here. So in other words, y is equal to 1 minus uh, 1 minus modulo of x plus modulo of 1 minus modulo of x. This is going to be this graph. And I'll leave it as exercise for you to just plot this on graph paper or using the the software and you check that you get this behavior. But in basically the point is that you can sort of interpolate all of these mod functions again and again to get any kind of t squared linear constant function. Okay. Anyway, I think we are almost out of time, or rather more than out of time. So I'll stop here. Uh, uh, I'll send you practice papers. Preferably try to solve them in a time manner now. So if I give you a one hour paper, quickly solve it in one hour and see how well you are doing with that. And we'll discuss the answers and solutions of that uh, after I'm done. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you. Bye, sir. Thank you. Sir. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir.